A warm welcome to a Magpie Circle podcast show. It's one with a difference tonight. We're going to actually be talking with someone who helped keep us down in the National League. That's on the one hand. The other hand, he's a proper Knots fan. His family are all big Knots fans. So this is going to be quite interesting to talk about his journey. I'm afraid we're going to have to relive that game at Wembley. Get it out of our system once and for all. Um, but a big welcome to Harrogate Town goalkeeper, National League goalkeeper of the year last year, I think it was, um, James Belshaw. Hi, Paul. Yeah, nice to be here. Thanks for the introduction. I hope there's not too many Knots fans to turn it off already. I hope you <laughs> stick with it. <laughs> hey, painful, but, but we know, uh, to use that very overworked football phrase, that you are um, one of our own. Um, we're going to come on to Wembley in a little bit. And I think there's some quite interesting stories to be had there from the insight that you got from your manager. And we're also going to be talking at length about an interview that you did and the importance of these shirts. And perhaps it was a bit of an own goal that we wore one of these. We didn't wear one of those. But we'll talk about that in a bit. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, you're a proper Knots fan. I know you have very fond memories of this team when you were a young lad, hence why I'm wearing the shirt. Um, talk to me about your family background, because you are a Knots family through and through. Yeah, so when I was a kid, my, my dad's massive Knots fan, season ticket holder since he was sort of five. And I think for him growing up we're in an era, well, same as me, really, where a lot of your mates are Forest fans. Um, dad was a, I'm sure all Knots fans know that. But, um, but no, dad was a massive Knots fan. And I think all pictures of me as a kid, you've got your junior Magpies membership, you've got your, all your Knots kits as, as a kid. And, and for me, it was, it was something that made me different to a lot of people at school. Like, I love being a Knots fan and wearing the shirts and, and, and sort of being proud to be a Knots fan. And then my dad would take me to the games. I think he he would have been sort of with the, the louder fans. But then when he started taking us, we sat in the family stand. And my grandpa used to come as well. So he used to come with him. So we'd we'd sit in the family stand and, and used to love going down to, to Meadow Lane every week. And, and yeah, some very, very fond memories of, of going to watch Knots. So, so whereabouts in Nottingham were you growing up? So I grew up in Clifton. So... Uh, was born on Clifton Estate and then moved on to the Grove when I was a kid and grew up in Clifton and I still live in Nottingham now. Um, but yeah, for me, like, like I said, Knots were a massive part of, of my upbringing and, and very sort of heavily influenced by my dad and, and yeah, taking us to games and, and being a part of that, that community. So it wasn't just you that went, so your brother went along as well, didn't he? Yeah, so I've got my younger brother. Um, he's, yeah, he's three years younger than me. So we used to go go to games together with my grandpa and then my dad would start taking there's a couple of lads who grew up on the same street as me so dad would take them as well and we'd all pile into my to my grandpa's car and, and so my dad could have a couple of pints and go down to, <laughs> go down to the match um but yeah we used to go in the um in the old boots club the embankment um I yeah, think it's no, embankment. We, we, yeah we used to go in there and play pool before games and you'd have a little uh, have a cob in there and that and and we, we'd be in there for one o'clock. Like I said, Dad would have a few pints before the game. We'd, we'd pester him for games with Paul and then head over to the game at games at three. But yes, yeah, some, some very fond memories. So, so first memories of teams that you were going to watch, players you liked, you know, did you always focus on goalkeepers or w w what can you remember? I did to an extent. My early sort of knots hero was Darren Ward. Um, huh? was the first keeper that I sort of remember watching. But my, my big favourite player uh, was Gary Strudden. So when I, um, when I was on my sixth birthday, I was mascot. Uh, we played Bristol Rovers. I think Tony Agarna scored. It was one all. And you remember uh, that one then, yeah? Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, 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 well, obviously I've seen stuff since, but that was like my first kind of memory. But I think Strudden got, um, he got sent off or he was injured or something for that game. So before the game, he used to go in and, Walk around. The, I think it was Sean Murphy was the skipper. He used to take us around the change rooms, and I've got pictures with like Graham Hogg and I think Vinnie Arkins, players Vinnie like Hawkins. that. Yeah, yeah. But Strada was um, was suspended or wasn't there. So the Tuesday after there was a home game, and my my very first like vivid memory was going to the ground, and my dad, the club had sorted it where Strada came to see me before and like signed my program and that, and I was waiting in like the reception underneath the the Pavis. 
and um, Strada walked in and sort of my eyes lit up and it's like, well, Gary Strada's here, like my hero. And that, that was like my very first kind of big memory. But, but the players that I sort of like, yeah, Darren Ward, sort of in the early days. And then as we started to go, um, Mark Stallard um, was a big Mark, Mark Stallard fan. Um, and who else was there? That season when Allardyce was the manager and Gary Jones, I think Gary Jones scored all the goals yep. for us that took us up. Um, so, so you would have been a regular and, in that championship season because that was obviously a very special season, you know, yeah. in, uh, of the last 20 odd years, other than the Monto, that was by far the most successful winning games week in, week out. Yeah, definitely. And I think Allardyce came in and obviously did for all the the bad sort of taste that he left knots with. I think he obviously did a fantastic job that season. And I think I remember, I think it was Mark Robson that scored against Leighton yeah. Orient in March to, to steal the promotion. And that was like the earliest kind of promotion, I think, at the time or, or secured the title in March, I think it was. And and that for me was kind of my, so my early memories of watching knots are like of success. Like obviously going there and the first, you see knots winning every week and think, oh, this is great. You get used to this. And then you soon realise that being a knots fan, that, that doesn't happen every week. It's kind of up and down. But yeah, that, Sort of that year, and then, like you said, the, the leading into the Monto Finance sort of fiasco era that season, um, were the two obviously successful seasons that I remember. But, but yeah, Stallard, Heffernan, uh, players like that were were my sort of heroes growing up. So, that's you as the fan going on a Saturday, Tuesday night um, from Clifton. Um, but you, as an aspiring footballer. You were picked up by Knotts at a very early age, correct? Yeah, so I played for Clifton All Whites. They were the first team I played for. And we were playing in one of the summer tournaments where the like the five aside tournaments. And I was in goal for one of them. And I was playing in an under nines team when I was seven. So I was playing two years above myself. And a Knotts scout went up to my dad and was like, Oh, is your son the keeper? And my dad was like, having a laugh here, like thought thought some obviously winding him up and but he's like, no, we really want to have a look at him. So I was picked up at seven. So I went to train with the Centre of Excellence, as it was called at the time. And then, um, but I couldn't actually sign until I was nine. So what, eight or nine. So what not said was, look, train with us for a year, still play for Clifton. So I still had sort of playing with my mates and then signed when I was eight. I think I've got a picture somewhere with Trevor Powell signing your sort of first contract, so to speak. Um, but no, yeah, that was... Obviously, a proud moment for my family. Like, I mean, Dad never, never really played as a kid. He was just obviously a Knotts fan, but never, never really played much. And then, yeah, from there, I spent well seven or eight years in the academy, um, and it, it, it was yeah, fantastic. So, so this was the infancy of the setting up of the uh, of, of the academy system. It, it, ironically, by Howard Wilkinson, um, who together with Jimmy Seal took the club into the top flight long before you were around. Your dad would remember them yeah. just about. I remember them very well. And Howard kind of set up this new blueprint for an academy system. And it was actually Brian Bates, I think, that set Knotts up uh, in that sort of um, late, late uh, mid to late 90s. So what was the commitment then for you as a seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old. What, 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 what was the diet? What was the, the working week for you after school coming to Knotts? So we train on a Tuesday, Tuesday night and a Friday night. So we train twice a week and then play on a Sunday. One of the big things that Knotts would sort of encourage the young players was to go and watch the first team. So every, every player got um, a little card. I used to think, oh, I'm, I'm big time. I've got one of these little centre of excellence cards. You flash it at the gate and you get in for free. Um, but Knotts would encourage you to obviously go and watch the first team and kind of, I remember at training, we'd always talk about first team games, especially as, as a goalkeeper training, because on a Friday we'd have, I'd do an hour and a half goalkeeping and then do an hour and a half with like my age group. So with like the goalkeepers, we'd talk about the first team keeper and when I think when Soldini was there and, and keepers like that, they'd come down to training and, and would sort of be involved with us. So, Did, very yeah, so, so, yeah, Sol was the first one I remember coming down. Um, and then obviously you'd kind of, you'd have that sort of connection to the first team, but we, we trained twice a week as keepers. We'd have our own training session. We had um, uh, Shaggy, a bloke called Paul Wilson for a while, who was a fantastic coach when I was younger. And then as we got older, we had, Darren Hayes was the yeah. 
he, he actually messaged me over Christmas. He sent me a couple of pictures with that he'd found of me when I was a kid at the Centre of Excellence. And AZ used to bring, um, he got these, we used to train on the, um, this was uh, Boots in Lady Bay. We used yeah. to train down there in Lady Bay. And there was the goalkeepers, we were shunted across onto the grass, like we weren't on the 3D, but there were no lights. So Daz AZ had got these old, crappy lights and this gen uh, that he bought and surprised he didn't give us like carbon monoxide poison <laughs> i don't know if it'd pass health and safety now but he banged these big lights on and we just get caked up in mud and stuff and but no train training was good and then you'd have the games against the sort of center of excellence like mansfield rotherham lincoln port vale teams like that on a on a sunday so every, every all the games were done on a sunday morning so as you're going through those age, those, those age group years, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, um, would there have been any other players in that, that group that went on to make it in the programme? No, and, and this is where, I'm, I mean, we're kind of coming on to it when they, when they shut down the academy. I think it was a massive, massive decision. Um, and I think good John Thordeson was a manager. 2006, and, and like I said, when I was 12, so that would have been 2002, I was I was quite highly thought of in the academy, and there was a few of us that that signed um, like a four year contract to when you're 16, which okay you don't yeah. get in front of it. It basically means like teams couldn't poach you, like yeah. So yeah. I was, so I was quite highly thought of, and I always thought right there's going to be a pathway into the first team, and then I think the first kind of I want to say backward step that they took was the I think 2004 it would have been they merged age groups. So they released half the players and merged like, so they had an under 10s, 12s, 14s and 16s. So they merged two age groups into one, but released like half the players for cost cutting. And then in 2006, the, we got in from school one day, me and my brother, we were both at the, the Centre of Excellence and the letter just said, Notts County Centre of Excellence is closing down, um, go and find yourself another club. So as a, as a kid, as a 15 year old kid, it's like, that's all, you know, like I've been at knots for my whole life. And, and I think now with a lot of stuff that's going on with, there's a lot of emphasis on young Academy players being released and support, especially with like the kid from Man City and, a few exactly. and, and you think in an era where there's not really social media, it's kind of, it's not really at the forefront. There's no, that, that you haven't got that platform to sort of talk about it. Like, there was hundreds of kids that just, you just get released. And it's like, what am I going to do now? And kind of going back to your early question, like we had some very good players at the academy. And I don't think from my time there, when all the, everyone was released, I don't think there's anyone playing football league from when that academy was shut down. And don't get me wrong, there were players that were good enough. Like there's a couple of lads in the year above me um, that were fantastic players and you think are oh, they bankers to to have a good career in football we'll go and play for the first team but I th it, it just completely cut the pathway off and then those kids you imagine you, dr you dreams of playing professional football it kind of it's a massive thing to take and obviously lads will go and play grassroots football and kind of fall out of love with football I've got a few of them on like Facebook and you see kind of what they're doing and that and obviously gone on and had good lives and successful in whatever they're doing but there's some lads that could have made it not not necessarily not but could have made a career out of football and there's there's i'd probably say there's about 10 or 15 lads from my time there that i went through that aren't playing football now that that should be and i would attribute most of that to the shutting down of the academy i think had the academy carried on you'd have seen more players in the first team and like you said fans want to see their own players in the first team. They want to have that connection to the club and players who who know a bit more about what it's like to, to play for Notts, like myself, like being a Notts fan. And I think that was, it was a backwards decision. I think they had to save, I think it saved them a couple of hundred grand a year. And you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, you never know what's going on behind the scenes at Notts, really. But there's, it, it was just, as a kid, very, very hard to take. And, and one that I think caused, well, probably caused a lot of a lads to drop out of football I th I'm, I'm just trying to get the chronology right here I, I think the background was that Derek Pavis had obviously run the club very very successfully for a long period of time never really got the respect he deserved mm -hmm. but he ran the club very very well 
And I think he, he, was, he was looking to get out, if I remember correctly, when I was writing my book. And um, we then had, uh, does Albert Scardino and Peter Story ring a bell for you? That The American oh, guy? Ring a bell, yeah. Yeah, and they, 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 they basically promised to buy the club and bring a bold new era. And of course, you know, uh, the one uh, thing missing fundamentally was, uh, was money. Um, and so the club ended up in administration. And I think certainly for some of the years that you would have been there, the club spent quite a long time in administration, I think, if, mem if memory serves. And yeah. so I'm guessing whoever, whether it was the administrator or whoever, took a view to try and chop money and an administrator normally isn't too worried about the ongoing success of the club. He's worried fundamentally about trying to keep the club going and making yeah. sure he can get his own fees. <laughs> Terrible slight on administrators, but that's yeah. kind of how it tends to operate. But clearly you and your other young players there all become collateral in that, all become collateral. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, like I said, they, you don't know what, <laughs> and, and, and as what's going on behind the scenes but as a kid like you've not really got any understanding of the concept of money so someone trying to tell you oh they've got to save 200 grand by doing x y z they've got to get rid of this asset they haven't got any assets in the first team they can sell they've got like trying to tell that to, to kids it, it it doesn't wash like because you don't have any any understanding of, of what's go of, of what's going on all you know is you're trying to be a pro footballer and then one minute you get a letter through the door. <laughs> I think as well, the way it was done probably wasn't the best. I think whether they'd have got us all in and, and kind of spoke to us or, or what, but it, it was literally go and go and find yourself another club. And, and yeah, like, like you said, I, I mean, even to this day, I, I'm not really sort of well versed on what was going on behind the scenes. It's just kind of one of those things that, like you said, collateral damage of someone trying to think, right, I've got a, I've got to save a football club. I need 200 grand from somewhere. Let's get rid of the academy because otherwise there's not going to be a football club. In the grand scheme of things, probably more important, but you've got a lot of kids' dreams and a lot of sort of issues to deal with as a, as a result of that. So I'm interested. You know, your family are diehard Notts County fans. Mm -hmm. You're a Notts lad through and through, as is your brother. Because I think your brother got released as well, didn't he, at the same time? Yeah, same time um, yeah. how, how does that affect the dynamic of you supporting Notts County and your dad and the family? What, what, I don't know if my dad would want me to say this, but he stopped going to watch Notts for, for a couple of years after that. I think he'd kind of seen the way that we'd been treated. It, the, that's why I ask. Yeah. Yeah. The way, the way that the club had kind of gone about it. And he, so I think as a family, we sort of stopped going. And then I sort of, that happened for a couple of years. And then I started playing on a Saturday. So that's when I sort of stopped going to watch knots regularly. Um, my dad started going back down uh, probably a couple of years. I think it was probably a season or two seasons he stopped going. I don't think he could stay away for too long. Um, but for me, that was kind of the end of my sort of childhood as a knots fan, as in going to watch knots every week playing on a Sunday because then after that it was straight into men's football pretty much it was go and play on a Saturday at 15 years old straight into men's football and kind of have a, a lesson and an upbringing in football that way. Did, did it um, f force you to reappraise your um, career path if you like because you know um, you went to the Beckett School. You've got 10 A-star pluses, whatever they are. Didn't get many of them myself at Greenwood Dale Comprehensive at the top of St. Um, You've got 10 of them and, and two. You, you must have been slacking in this. you only got two ordinary A's in the other subjects. So um, you're, clearly, you're clearly a bright lad. Um, did that affect your career path and thoughts and what you want to do? Um. <clears throat> Potentially made me focus more on my schoolwork. I think I'd always kind of kept, like we said, I've always kind of kept my grades up and got decent grades throughout school. But when you're sort of 14, 15 and you're being talked about as a potential like first team player down the line, that's, that's your focus. Like I wanted to play for knots. Like that was all I wanted to do, regardless of my grades, 
or or whatever I'd have left school at 16 and and gone on a scholarship with Knotts and tried to do it that way but I was I guess fortunate that I had that kind of academic ability that I could obviously have something to fall back on so after that I, I dropped in I went to I went I had a sort of token trial at Forest and Leicester and they at the time I, I wasn't I was quite a late grower, so I wasn't really as tall as what I am now. So they just sort of took one look at me and was like, yeah, it's too small, too small. They've made the mind up as soon as you've turned up. Yeah. He's not so, big enough to be a goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah. so um, I went to play for Hena Town when I was 15, 16 in Central Midlands League. Um, I knew the manager there from like tenuous links. So at that time, when I was playing for Hena Town, you turn up on a Saturday, you're playing with lads who work all week, play on a Saturday, have a beer afterwards football was not really that serious and that's probably when I started thinking you know what football's football's not going to be for me I'm not going to have a career in football I'm going to I stayed at sixth form at Beckett to get my A-levels I thought right I'm going to go and get my degree and and that's going to be it I'm not going to have a career in football and then I played for Hena Town for about a season and then when I was in my second year at sixth form which would have been a second year scholar I got um a phone call from a bloke just saying, oh, um, there's a Walsall scout that came to watch you or wants to have a look at you and are you interested? And I was, you know, one of them, it's just like, oh yeah, whatever. And then got a phone call. So I went to, to Walsall in the October half term. I just turned 18 and had a sort of a week long trial with them. And they were like, yeah, definitely we want to sign you. But it was a weird situation because to sign at that point, they want you to be there full time, but I'm getting my A-levels. And at that, and it's like, do I risk throwing my A-levels away to go? So I sort of went to them and said, look, I, can't, I have to do my A-levels. I'm happy to play on a Saturday, but I can't train in the week. And they were like, fine, they wanted me. So they said, look, stay at six one, do your A-levels, play for the youth team on a Saturday. So I sort of did that for a couple of months. And that's when you start to think, okay, like you're getting back into it. You train, you're, you're playing with better players. I mean, that youth team, we had uh, Will Grigg, um, Jamie Patterson, who was at Forest, he's at I think he's at Bristol City now. Um, but we had, we had a good youth team at Walsall, and then from the January, I started being involved with the first team, and that's when it kind of went up a notch, and I was missing sort of weeks of school at a time. But my teachers were happy; they just sort of said, "Look, working working digs, do your work outside school as long as you keep your grades up, you're fine." So I was like buzzing, and then that's when football started to to kind of kick on a bit and, and you get that buzz for it back and, and you realise, you know what, like I am good enough to, they're in League One at the time, I am good enough to be football league keeper I am, and you get that sort of love for the game back but it was from a random phone call of someone seeing me play in front of the dog and duck um, on a Saturday and then that's, that phone call has probably got me to where I am. So, so, so when you were the minute at Walsall there, so James Walker, Jimmy Walker would have been number one keeper? He just left. He literally, ah. yeah, he just left. Because you know he's from Sutton in Ashfield. Yeah, he's at yeah. Knotts, never played a game and got released and became record appearance holder for Walsall. Yeah, yeah. Wacker was a big, a big sort of Walsall legend. Um, no, it was Clay Clayton Ince was the number one then. He was 37. Oh, yeah. Trinidad yeah. and Vegan. Yeah, yeah. And the number two was uh, Rene Gil Martin, who's, he's now, he went to Watford. He's now coach at Bristol City. I still speak to Rene quite a bit, but, I was sort of third, I was third choice, and there was um, Jimmy Mullen was the manager. He got mm -hmm. sacked, and Chris Hutchins came in um, as the gaffer, and that's when I had this opportunity to go to America. Okay. So um, we kind of at the end of my sort of career at Walsall, I was eighteen. I sat down with Chris Hutchins. I didn't have an agent at the time; just kind of did all did it all myself. And he was like, "Look, you're going to be third choice keeper. Can't really offer you much money. I think they offered me like hundred quid a week or something." <laughs> Um, we haven't got much money to offer you. Are you interested? And I just said that because of my grades, I had this opportunity to go to America. That came about whilst playing at Walsall. We played Chelsea in the Youth Cup. Um, that And that Chelsea side was unbelievable. They had um, Fabio Barini, um, players like that, that were just Gail Kakuta, that were just a, a cut above. And we got beat 5-1. But I had a worldie in the game and there was... Uh, this video was sent over to someone in America along with like my grades um, and I got a phone call from this guy in America and it was like ask, inviting me to, to go to Duke University and I was like the hell is that I'd never even thought of going to America so you start looking into it and 
I had this opportunity to go out there. I went out there in March for like a trial game and, and they offered me a, a full scholarship to go out and play football out there and, and, and get my degree. So weighing up a one year pro contract on <laughs> no money at all and getting a full education paid for, I think it's a no brainer. So I took the opportunity to go to the States. So you had three years there. And of course, I'm guessing while, while you'd have been in the States, that would have been coincided with the Munto season, wouldn't it? So, so yeah. that would have been knots with Munto. Your dad would have been happy and we presume you were keeping in touch as best you could and thinking knots are now going to be, you know, one of the big 20 biggest soccer clubs in the world. Oh God, that the whole Munto thing. I was in the States and it was when I'd just gone out there that first season and you see obviously Casper signed, um, Husey signed <laughs> and you see all this thing with Sven Joran Eriksson taking <laughs> knots counting and you're like, what is going on with football? Like, how, how does that even happen? I think Hans Backer, wasn't it? He brought in and uh, as, as Gaffer and people like that and it was just an abs... It, and you, not so, you hear all these reports of not spending stupid money and... That was the whole Sol Campbell thing when he came for a game, wasn't it? That's um, it. In, That's in that it. season. And, and yeah, I mean, that season for Knotts. And to be honest, my, my dad says that he, he put Lee Hughes in close to being in one of his all-time like Knotts favourite players and Knotts teams. Because, I mean, what Lee Hughes did that season for Knotts was, was unbelievable, the, the, the goals that he scored. But that was, yeah, that obviously going to America, you, you're away. But I'm getting all the Americans. So I've got the Americans watching Knotts and yeah. all um, my roommate was from Dallas and I'd taken over knot shirts for him and his brother so they're all wearing knot shirts around campus so it's kind of like a thing everyone's sort of talking about it and so I'd like to think I took knot stateside but very, <laughs> I don't know how far I actually went but very good now um, one of the people you met out there was in your year um, for those that follow the NBA Mason Plumley, who is a big well big in every sense of the word uh, was Denver Nuggets now, I think, as you just informed me before we went on air, uh, Detroit Pistons. So you got friendly with Mason, yeah? Yeah, so Mason was the same same year as me. And at the university, like, university sports out there are ridiculous. It's massive. Yeah. So, like, yeah. especially the university I went to, Duke University, like, Duke basketball. Is I was like, going to say, Duke is primarily renowned as a basketball college, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, the Duke basketball program is one of the best in the country. They've got the best coach in the country, coach, the coach uh, Mike Krzyzewski coaches the US national team as well. Um, but yeah, Mason was in my year and we have like, your athletes kind of stick together. So like in sports, because you, you're on the same sort of schedules, like it's so demanding. Like with us, we trained every morning and then literally you finish training at 11, you're running off, getting a shower and you're going to lectures for the rest of the day, doing your uni lectures, doing your uni work. So every, they kind of know, you have all the athlete like, study zone so with his athletes only and so became sort of close with Mason and, and a few of the others and and yeah he's gone on to earn a few million quid I messaged him um when he got traded to Detroit and we had a little chat and that but um but no he's he's done all right for himself I hopefully lend me a few quid when we're older yeah. so so the question is was he a Notts County fan uh, Mason knew about Notts County he didn't have a Notts County shirt I don't think they did him in <laughs> whatever size but no um but no yeah that was my kind of mission to to spread Notts County around, around the university, around, around America, and, and see how many people we could get on board. Very good. And, and I think what's also very positive is that the experience of being released, which was clearly a very, very painful one for anyone who's on a programme and gets caught, but doubly, trebly so when they are fans of that club and go to the games. But by then, you'd got it out of your system and all the rest of it, yeah? Yeah, like, like I said, it kind of it flipped my priorities on, on its head, kind of sort of the love for football went, but then it, again, like you said, you look back at life and, and things get you to where they are. And if, if I had stayed at Notts, I might, might not have got a pro contract. It might have not worked out. It, it might have worked out, but, but yeah, it, 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 it was what it was and, and it got me to where I am and I, w I wouldn't change my career for anything. Um, so you do, was it three year, four year course at Duke? Um, so then was there a chance you would have ended up staying stateside because there are a lot of opportunities soccer wise one of my clients for my company is, is Major League Soccer MLS it's come on in leaps and bounds it's certainly a lot bigger now than it was in 29, 2010 but nevertheless that, that, that whole MLS system is working very well and a lot of people go over there and don't come back Which, was it always your plan to come back? Um, it was one of those that was up in the air I went out and 
and um, not many first year students like in the team play but I was I played pretty much every game when I was there and was touted as being one of the the top prospects uh, top keeper prospects in the country so when you finish your degree so I graduated early so you're supposed to do four years but I graduated in three and a half years to go in the MLS draft so the way that the MLS works for those that don't know is that they have what so they have what's called a combine in January so they invite the top 80 players in the country and you go for a, we did it in Florida a week-long training camp and all the coaches come and watch you you have meetings with different franchises and and then the draft the draft happens a couple of weeks after that so you literally sat watching the draft and you wait for your name to come up. You're seeing your name being touted about. They're talking about you. And, and then it came up with, I was picked 49th by Chicago Fire. And then I got a text within half an hour from the Chicago Fire like liaison guy. I was like, you're on a flight at six in the morning to join our training camp. Um, that was in Florida as well. So get on that. And so you go, bang. So it was in Florida the following morning. Um, and then did a uh, preseason with the Chicago Fire. So when you get drafted, a team gets your rights, basically. Yeah. So the team that finished, for those that don't know, the team that finishes bottom of the league gets the first pick. So they try and... It, yeah. like, you, you can't turn around and say, I don't want to play for the Chicago Fire. <laughs> You're exactly. going. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a concept that all Americans in any sport yeah. are kind of happy with. And so, But when you get drafted, they don't automatically get a contract straight away. You still have to earn one. So there was three other keepers at this training camp on trial for one spot. They got rid of one after the first training camp. Then we had one in LA, got rid of another keeper. Then we had the last camp in South Carolina. It was me and this other keeper. And the, the goalkeeper coach was an English bloke, Aaron Hyde, um, was a Brummie and good coach, to be fair. And he, he pulled me and said, look, we want to offer you a contract. So he said the, the MLS was because you signed with the league. The MLS will send you contract through. So I got this contract through and then I spoke to the Frank Clopas was the manager of Chicago Fire and I said, how long do I have? He said, you've got 24 hours. So I was like, I'm 22 years old. I've got to make a decision to sign a three-year contract in America or to go back to England. Now, at the time, I had an agency that I was working with and Walsall wanted me back. So I had a chance to go back to Walsall on a three or four months till the end of the season or a three-year contract in America. Now, the contract was each year was an option year. Mm. So what they do is they, they increase your wage each year, but for keepers that don't play or whatever, they bin you off after the first year, re-offer yeah. you a minimum contract, and they, they've got you by the board. Yeah. Um, so I at 24 hours, I was on trying to find an apartment in Chicago to rent, which ain't cheap. And you sort of look, and for, honestly, for, for a 22-year-old kid, it, well, you say kid, but 20, for a 22-year-old to you've got to then decide, do I want to build a life in America? Do I want to build a life in England? Um, I tried not to talk to my parents too much about it because there's obviously bias there. They want you to come home. So I went, I, and I just thought, you know what? Like, I want to be home. I want to come back and play. And there wasn't really a guarantee of anything back here. I went on, just went in at Walsall for a few months, didn't get paid, just on like an extended trial. But yeah, it, it was hard and, and you learn a lot about yourself in, in those sort of times. You learn about what's a priority, what, where you want to be in life and, and yeah, 24 hours and decided to come back. Okay, so you've come back. Did I, did I read somewhere that you actually had a, a, a small trial with knots again or was that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. so when I came, before the combine, I came back at Christmas and I actually, I, um, I actually went to Everton for a week and trained, like just to train, trained at Everton with Tim Howard and a couple of the keepers there. And then Knotts, it was, who was the manager? Keith Curl was the manager and yeah. Pilk was the goalkeeper coach. And um, spoke to Pilks and he said, yeah, come in. Um, so I went in, uh, I think Bartosh was there. Yeah. Uh, he was the number one. And I went in for a couple of days with Knotts and they just said, yeah, we like you, but um, we can't afford to sign any keepers at the minute. So we'll, we'll be in touch. And that was sort of the last kind of contact I'd, I'd had with Knotts, really. And and it, it was kind of a shame. Like you, like you said, as a kid, all I wanted to do was play for Knotts. And you think as soon as that comes up, it's like, right, this could be it, this could be it. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, it didn't, didn't obviously materialise for one reason or another. But yeah, I went in, trained at Highfields, had a couple of days with them then. Okay, so you're back in England. Um, and 
over the next few years, you, you, you rein, reinvents the wrong word, but you were able then to carve out a career in football, but it wasn't straight away in professional football, was it? Um, you worked your way kind of at what we would call the non-league ladder. You know, yeah. uh, ta- you, were, you were at Tamworth. And I think when you ended up at Harrogate, Harrogate, w- were they National League North or one below that? Because you basically played a big part in Harrogate rising through the divisions to the Football League, yeah? Yeah, so I was at Tamworth for... Had a year at Nuneaton, signed for Tamworth for three years, and that was all part-time. So I worked, I had a job and play part-time football and again like we've said earlier you kind of get into that mindset this is going to be me like I'm going to be a part-time footballer earning decent money part-time have a full-time job and kind of and that's that's going to be me and then I sort of fell out of love with the job that I was doing it wasn't a career I wanted to be in and I also started my own coaching academy so I still run that in in knots now so I'm in my fifth season of well at the minute it's a bit difficult obviously with what's going on but I'm so I've got my own coaching business. I've got my own goalkeeping academy. So I set that all up and I thought, right, and I can't do all three things. It was just getting way too much. I couldn't play part-time work and do my coaching. So I just bought a house and I just went, right, I'm quitting my job. Like, I, I can't do it anymore. And, and walked out of my job and was like, what have I done? Like, obviously, mortgages to pay and my coaching business and time with money was just about covering everything. And then I sort of fell out of love at... at with Tamworth and I played every game and there was a bits going on behind the scenes there. And, and I spoke to Simon Weaver at Harrogate and they were in the national league North at the time. And he said, look, we're going full time. Um, we, we see a progression. This is where we want to see the club. These are the plans for the club. This is what we're investing in. And these are the players we're bringing in. And I was like, right, I'm having a bit of that. So I signed for Harrogate 2017 that summer and won the playoffs that year, National League North. Um, so I went into the National League, played pretty much every game. Well, I played pretty much every game since I've yeah. been there then. Yeah. First year in the National League, we finished in the playoffs, uh, lost to Fylde in the sort of playoff eliminator in the way that system worked in the National League. And then obviously the third season at, Knott's, uh, at Harrogate um, got promoted. And so we've had two promotions in three years and, and take the club into the Football League, which on a list of my achievements is is bang right up there like what what we've done as a club and and what I'd say is a common misconception about Harrogate is there's a load of money behind them they, they chuck money about and, and we don't like our budget was probably middle of the road National League budget um we, we're not big big spenders um and we just did it with what was kind of pleasing we did it with a core group of lads so I think Nine or ten of the squad at Wembley were also in the squad when we won the National League North playoff final. So it's the same core lads that have gone National League North, National League, League Two. So to be a part of that has been, yeah, fantastic. That's a very interesting comment because uh, Martin Allen, very charismatic, good friend of mine, um, literally when we're doing these recordings the day before martin spoke about how uh, he he felt that at national league level you needed hungry players and he actually did say you know my son just watching us going you know players from national league national league south north hungry step up delighted to be playing in that league there's an appetite and that was you just said it there that was very much your blueprint and i think barrow also with 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 he never had a had a very settled core of the team didn't they um but let's look at that season which obviously ended with the playoff game um so you must have thought crikey at the start of that season i'm going to be playing Notts county i can't believe they've been relegated yeah yeah obviously (laughs) we well, we had our end of season presentation from the season before the day. Was it Swindon that beat Knotts on yeah. the last? Yeah. yeah. So I, we were we were all in the bar um, and we we're watching the scores come in, and he obviously had a few beers and that, and you think Knotts will come down like playing against Knotts next year. So that was obviously the first fixture that we looked out for, and we had played them at, at Harrogate early doors. That's it, midweek. Yeah. So that first first game. And not first half, not battered us. Absolutely right. battered us at Harrogate. I think I made three or four half decent saves. And then we had a man sent off just for half time, penalty. And then second half, 
we just we went at knots with 10 men and we were pretty much camped in knots as half and then Enzio scored I think it was Enzio scored late on header one to two nil and we struggled we had a slow start and we'd obviously taken the league sort of taken to it well the year before we'd had a slow start and I think end of September we were like 17th 18th and we're almost thinking we've got to consolidate here because what he'd done he'd gone and re- he bought players in from the football league, which he'd not done before. Mm. So he bought Steady in. Now, I absolutely love John Stead to bits. We get on really well. And Steady's been a really good asset to the dressing room. But he bought in a few other lads that went completely against the blueprint of what we'd done. And they were a really big centre forward, really big lad. Yeah, Mark Beck. So he's he's one of the young lads that well, one of the young lads. He looks about forty two, but he's actually twenty five. Is he? Okay? <laughs> yeah. him down as an old stage. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Becky always gets that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he signed Steady and a few of the lads, and it just it just wasn't working. And then we hit a run of form sort of before Christmas, and and then obviously going into the new year, kind of obviously carried on that form, and then we were obviously due due to play knots. Um, in the league and then we obviously drew knots in the semi-final of the trophy and as soon as that came up because I hadn't played any of the trophy games up until that point it kind of like left you out to play the other keeper yeah yeah so the the other keeper was playing so then knots um, the draw came against knots my phone's going off I've been asked to do interviews so I just rang the gaffer and said look gaffer am I playing and he was like yeah you're going to play so I knew I was playing right in the, in, had it had the semi final gone ahead because I think Knotts were talking about trying to break the record attendance, yeah, 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 yeah. And, all, and all of that. Um, and then obviously COVID hit and and didn't obviously get the chance to play at Medellin, which was the one I was looking forward to. Obviously, playing against Knotts at Medellin, like I still didn't get to do it this year because I was injured when we actually played the semi final, yeah. Um, but that was one thing that I wanted to do, I wanted to play at Medellin. And if it can't be four knots, obviously playing against knots. And that would have been, yeah, that would have been special. But obviously didn't get the chance. Okay. So let's come on to, because this, this I think is quite interesting. So um, you beat whoever you beat, we beat Barnet. So you now know you are playing Notts County at Wembley. Clearly from a media perspective, I mean, everybody is going to be all over you because you're kind of the story, aren't you? Because by this point, everybody knew about your Notts County connections, your dad and all the rest of it, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we, we joked when, uh, when Notts came down, me and my dad, <laughs> I joked with him, I said, oh, it's going to be a Harrogate Notts playoff final, isn't it? He was like, God, don't. He was like, I couldn't deal with it. So, so anyway, materialised and I had the B- BBC's Midlands around my house. I had all the interviews and stuff yeah. leading the game. And... It was, it was quite surreal. Um, it's the biggest game of my career. I'm playing for a team that I've been through so much with, with some of my best mates who I've been with them for three or four years together. And you're playing against your boyhood club. Now, in any other circumstance, I'm in the stands watching Knots. I've got my Knots shirt on and I'm going to support Knots with 30-odd thousand Knots fans or however many they would have taken to Wembley. But obviously, I've got a job to do. And so you've got playing at Wembley for the first time, which in itself is an, an emotional experience. You've got promotions to the Football League for the first time on the line, and it's against your boyhood club that all your family are fans of that you've grown up watching. So those three things, it's like you just get overwhelmed. So I kind of allowed myself in the build-up to the game to kind of soak it all in make the most of that build up but then as soon as we traveled down there it was like right that is, is you've just got to park it like the two things that helped we discussed one uh one was the kit now playing against knots in a black and white kit for me psychologically you can real you look at it and go i'm playing against knots county like it's just a subconscious thing you i've worn the black and white kits growing up but because we finished second, we obviously wore our yellow and black. So playing against knots in a green kit with no fans in the stadium doesn't feel like you're playing against Notts County because as much as I'm assuming all the players are good lads, I, I didn't know any of the Notts players. So I've, I've got no kind of connection to 
any anyone in that stadium involved with knots i've got no real connection with so the two things that helped were they're not playing in a black and white kit and there wasn't thirty thousand knots fans behind my goal because i think that made a massive difference not to not having fans i think that suited us a lot more okay very very good point and so when i was doing my prep um and you, you kind of alluded to it so in one of the interviews i think it was nottingham post lee curtis um you, you said and this this would have been a week or so before the game what helps this is from you what helps was they weren't wearing black and white and they won't be wearing that kit at wembley psychologically it helps because had they been playing in black and white then you instantly realize it's not i will be able to compartmentalize it and when i get to wembley i'll have a look around for a minute and take it all in okay so i'm a very old school you see i'm older than your dad and, and i've worked with some quite wily <laughs> managers who never miss any tricks so these were the two kits that we could have worn um you had the right you you, you had the right to play in your home kit yeah yellow we wear this one okay didn't have to black and white if I'd seen that, the first thing I would have done at Notts would have been, I'd have got onto the league and said, right, we're not going to wear our away kit now. We're going to wear this one. We'll change the colour of the shorts if we need to. Yeah. Mm. Um, but whatever. And there is a precedent for this, believe it or not, because back in 1990, when your dad's first trip to Wembley to watch Notts, um, Notts were playing Tranmere. They were all in white and they won the toss or whatever. And so not black and white stripes were told they had to change. Derek Pavis, clever lad, uh, got onto the league and appealed. And he said, well, we'll wear black and white. Look, it's really not a clash. We'll change any shorts or others, to, but we want them to wear our black and white. We're the world's oldest professional club. And he got the league to agree to it. I don't know whether Tranmere would have been happy or not, but anyway, we played in black and white. We played in black and white to beat Tranmere. We played in black and white to uh, beat Brighton. Um, and we all know what football's like. You know, you've been in it years. I've been in it donkey's years. They're silly superstitions, but they can make a difference. And we all kind of like, if we win, it's because we wore this. You know, Martin O'Neill. You know, we, we, uh, I digress. But at Leicester, we had a great track record on Merseyside against Liverpool. Never used to get beat, unbelievably. And we did well at Everton as well. And we always used to stay at the Haydock Park Thistle um, next to the race course. And it weren't the best of hotels. I'm hoping no one's listening in. <laughs> in fact, it was bloody terrible. And we hated it, but we'd win. And Martin would say, right, we've won. We're coming back for when we play Everton later in the season. And he kind of almost didn't want to win. So we had an excuse to change hotels, but we never got beat. So we went to the Haydock Thistle twice a year for about six years on the trot, having never lost a game. But it's all superstition there. The reality is, does it really make a difference? But, but football people are superstitious. And with that, with you and the black and white, absolutely. I'd have got the black and white stripes out. It would have probably made no difference to you whatsoever. But they're them little old school tricks that football people do, you know? Yeah, it was, ju it was just something that, it, like you said, it might, be, it might have been silly, might not have made any difference. But to me, like, it was easier to kind of park it to one side and go, you know what, it's just a team in green. It's not Notts County because obviously they weren't wearing the black and white. But, but yeah, whether it made a difference, I don't know. So, so, so tell me, not that we want to be reminded about this, um, you, you did a number on us. Let's be perfectly honest. You completely and utterly did a number on us. You outplayed us. You battered us. I don't know of one single Notts County fan who does not think Harrogate should have won, deserved to win, and good luck to them. There were no real straws that we could, we could clutch at because we were, we were fundamentally comprehensively outplayed. So was it because Notts didn't turn up? Was it because of, you know, your manager and all the rest of it? Was there like a, a master plan that you had? Um, not really. We, we didn't really look at Notts until the end of the week. And 
with obviously the result against Barnet, we expected Knotts to line up the same. Now, I thought that was a mistake with Knotts because Jim O'Brien's not a left winger. And I think lining up with Jim O'Brien on the left side of midfield against our most attacking threat, really, which is our right fullback, I think that was a battle that we won. I think from the first couple of minutes, and I, I listened to Neil Ardley's interview afterwards. I think Neil Ardley speaks very well. And he said, we prepped him for exactly what happened out there because that's what Harrow, that's what us as a team we do. We're high intensity. We press high. If you stay in the game, we'll give you chances. And we just went all hell for leather said, right, we, especially the centre halves, we're going to target the centre halves. We're going to pressure, press them high, win the ball back, move the ball quickly, make it just a, a scrappy, quick, intense game that, that, that suited us. We, apart from obviously scoring straight after half time, and then I think not had a, a couple of chances. We had a little spell after the Kel Roberts free kick. Yeah, after that, Enzio's hit one just past the, I think just past the right post that was closer than I thought until I watched it back. Um, and then I think I had one save to make. I think it was pulled back to Carl and I think, or someone. I've made a couple of saves and we had that spell. Now in that spell, I think if you've got 30,000 Knots fans behind that goal at Wembley, because that's where they'd have been sat, I think there's a different sort of vibe after that. But I think... Knots kind of sat off us a bit, allowed us to to play a little bit more. Then when we got the third, that just yeah, it, yeah, it, 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 it just killed the game. But like like you said, Neil Ardley came out and said he prepped them for exactly what happened. That's what when we when we looked at Knots, we knew that Cal Roberts was a threat. We knew he like the goal he scored against Barnet, try and stop him cutting inside onto his left foot. We knew we knew it'd be a threat. Um and Apart from that, we we thought we'd have legs over them in midfield um, against Mitch Rose and and Doyler. We knew we'd have we'd have legs in there to get round them. So as long as we move the ball quickly, we had Jack Diamond on the left wing, who was a great loan signing from Sunderland, um, who who had a who had a great game. And and to be fair to Steady, even when Steady came on, Steady made the made the third goal with that bit of he dropped the shoulder on the halfway line and played a ball in for more doing before the balls come in. So it was one of those days where. It's clicked for us. Um, to be honest, I think if the season would have gone on, I think either Knotts or Harrogate would have won the league. It, it, yeah, it's an interesting point. Yeah, I think, I think we were on a great run of form. Knotts were coming good. Knotts were on a good run. I think one of us would have caught Barrow and it may would have been a different playoff final. But like I said, on, on the day for me, I managed to get my dad into the game, which was... Wow which was amazing. So we had 14 tickets for directors or whatever, and one of them couldn't come. So they, um, they said to my dad, oh, um, well, they said to me, they, the captain, uh, folks, his dad came, and then they said to me, like, Belly, like, I've got a ticket. Does your dad want it? So I rang my dad, and he was proper emotional, like, yeah. So my dad was in the ground. Um, so I've kind of looked up. I've seen where he was sat, um, where, the not, where the Harrogate directors were. And I think there was a whole thing leading up to it, oh, Paul, who are you going to support? Who are you going to support? Is it going to be Knotts or Harrogate? I think deep down, I think it did hurt him watching Knotts lose, but to see me win at Wembley, I think I think he'd have, he'd have chosen me every. Well, I like to think he'd have chosen me every time. I think, I think my mum would have divorced him if, if, if he'd have, if he'd have chosen Knotts. But but no, let's hope that let's hope that Knotts can do it this year. I think we certainly hope so. Um, now then, we always like to have a bit of um, interaction with supporters. Um, and uh, sometimes we have questions. Uh, for this one, we're going to have uh, something a little bit different. And for those of you watching, some listen on podcasts. Um, we've got a we've got a Notts County season ticket holder on. Hold on. <laughs> now then, Mr. Belshaw Senior. Hello, Mr. Mace. How are you? Hey, have you finished reading my book yet? Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I did say to James that part of the thing that I really enjoyed was it, it wasn't done in a, a real chronological order. You know, there was chapters that you could dip in and dip out and, you know, it sort of took you on the journey and, and the way the chapters were based around sort of personalities of the time as opposed to um, 
you know, just saying this season was this and this season was that. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was a, it was a good read. Very perceptive. I can see a little bit where your son gets the brains from because that's exactly how I wanted the book to be, to be fair. Didn't want it to be and then, and then, and then. But enough yeah. of the book. Enough of the book. We've been listening and talking um, with your son uh, about his journey from... Yeah. Uh, he, he was telling us how uh, he always wanted some extra games of pool at the Boots uh, Social Club before yeah. games in the 90s. Um, yeah. I, I mean... You, you, Look, he's, he's listening and he's watching. You, you, you must be very proud of him. We've just been talking about Wembley. Yeah, talk to us about your emotions for that day, that week. It was it was weird because as, as it was building up, I mean, when it was the the semi finals, um, I'd, I'd sort of got um, one of my not shirts out and a Harrogate shirt and. <laughs> Sort of put on Facebook, well, I'm changing shirts now. You know, I've sort of um, watched Harrogate win and then watched Knott's beat Barnet. And um, then it was the realisation sinking in that, you know, it was going to be Knott's and, and, and Harrogate at Wembley. And sort of resigning myself to the fact of, of you know, although I'd been to the five previous occasions we've been at Wembley, thinking, well, myself and nobody else will be there. And then to receive a call late on the Friday to say, there's one ticket and you can go. It was amazing. But yeah, the build-up. But it's a strange one, really, because, you know, Knots have been a massive part of my life, similar to yourself, uh, for over 50 years. And... You know, you, you, you sort of feel for your family transcends all that. Uh, and it was weird on the day, sort of, I was sat there in the Royal Box, sort of socially, and the nearest person to me was Colin Slater. And, uh, yeah, it was, just, it was just strange, but, and it was, it was strange watching knocks and yet just wanting James to be successful and, and Harrogate to win. It was it was a weird experience. You know, to, to know the journey James has been on from me taking him to Clifton or White, so I started off at five and, you know, not snapping him up very early and then, you, you know, not closing the centre of excellence. And, and the journey he's been on, you know, going to America and then coming through uh, at Nuneaton and Tamworth and Harrogate. And the realisation this could mean him going in the football league was, was, was weird. But I, James made the point that with the fact that knots were in green and not, not in black and white helped him. I think it's a weird thing, you know. Um, yeah, it was strange. But on, on the day... I suppose emotion took over for a, 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 I wasn't an Ops fan. I was a, I was a proud dad, as you know, is a, a hashtag of mine on Twitter. You must be very proud of your son. I know it's difficult with him being on the line. Um, but we were talking earlier, and we've tried in this this podcast to to go through your son's journey. You know, like you yeah. said, Clifton yeah. All Whites, mascot for the club, yeah, scouted by the club, being released in. Um, very, very difficult circumstances and ends up going back via Hena, Walsall, Duke University, uh, yeah. all stations to Nuneaton, Tamworth, and Harrogate. So fantastic, fantastic perseverance. But I was interested in your, and I asked your son this, your family's reaction to, we, to when they were cut and, and uh, when he was released. And he did say that you'd, you had to take a little bit of a break from knots to just to cope with that departure? I, th I think what, what did me was, was the fact of one, even though I, I did read your chapter on it with interest, um, like many parents, I felt it was unnecessary. Um, I've seen everything that the Trust put, and it was Howard Wilkinson that was a big mover in it. But there were one or two parents there that had done the math 
knew how much because the football league actually gave a grant that paid 100 percent and the football league were cutting that grant by a certain cash figure now not there were there were parents that had said okay well we'll we'll look and see if we can raise this shortfall um and nobody nobody listened nobody was interested and and i think the worst thing for me was the fact that i found out about it um on radio nottingham and the boys were in school and when when you've got um children in elite sport there can sometimes be a negative reaction from schoolmates from old mm. club members, etc and all that and and they were out you held on a bit of a pedestal the guys were at school and it suddenly broke and they came home and during that day we got a letter and and this, the other thing going back to the finance um as I say, I, I was interested in your chapter on it, obviously. Um, going back to the finance is that um, David, my youngest son, was signed by Forrest and had two years at Forrest uh, in the academy. And Forrest were obviously um, had a similar um, level of deduction to Knox. And what Forrest did was... Um, cancel the coaches, the actual physical buses taking people to away games. Because at Knox, you used to have a coach go every Sunday with teams and parents to wherever one age group was playing. Um, and what Forrest said was, OK, we'll have a money bus for any, any players that, whose family can't pay them, but we would ask parents to support and take them and in in, a, in one fell swoop they made up the financial difference in it and i think for me it was from the club's perspective um the standing in the local community was damaged so much because what what academies and centers of excellence do is to spread the word about the club um, I'm stood there as a parent when the boys were at County and I was the season ticket holder anyway. But there's other parents there that then start going along to the club. And, and these academies and centres of excellence or whatever, or feeders and, and everything, they don't just provide players for the club. They bring families and people into the club. Um, and it's spreading the word and spreading support. And, and I think Knott's lost so much of that over the two years. And what I said was, I said, there, there's no way I'm going to Madeleine while they're not having a youth system because I, I fundamentally disagree with it and the way it was done. And, and it was, it was two, the two seasons, I never set foot there. And then um, they announced um, at the start of the season after that, they said, we realised we've made a mistake, we're going to start again. And even though it didn't affect my two boys, I felt, you know, that's what I want my club to be. And it, it, was, it was the way it was handled, it was handled appallingly. And, you know, players like James and what it did to them, you, you accept that. But it, it was, you know, you, you, you have to be so careful with, with young people, how you, you handle them. And, you know, it was, it was weird. David was there. David uh, had two years at Forest and then was released by Forest and went on to enjoy playing, you know, at an amateur level in university. And, uh, and as I say, James has, has filled you on his journey. And I just think Knott's lost so much, so much unnecessarily at that time. You know, they, they, you understand the people in the trust. I thought you went into the trust business and I got a high level of understanding as a supporter from your book and, and thoughts on that. But, yeah, it, it, I, it could have been avoided. I, I, I would totally agree. And, and just to square that one off, 
uh, and, and obviously your son's actively involved in developing the next generation of coaches and all the rest of it. Whichever way you look at it, um, Knotts as a club, for the best part of, and I'll upset a few people here, but it, you know, you, you judge things on results. Knotts have not had a pathway for young players for 10, 15 years now. Players haven't come through Knotts' system and gone into the team. Your son's too young to remember, but Knotts with Jimmy Cyril and in the years after Jimmy Cyril had a tremendous legacy for producing players that got into Knotts' first team and played regular football in the football league. That There has been an, a, a massive paucity of young talent at Knotts. What's been, I think, very frustrating uh, for, uh, for Knotts fans most recently is that there are players out there that are now being successful in the football league that were at Notts County. You know, my son, yeah. uh, my son Colby Bishop comes from Gedling yeah. round our manor released by Notts. He's probably worth a lot of money for Accrington now. You know, yeah. I, 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 he will probably go for seven figures. He's, he, he's scoring goals regularly, regularly in league one. Curtis Thompson, a local lad allowed to leave and is playing three divisions higher than us. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I mean, and, and these were players that were released. These were not players that were ultimately poached and, and we couldn't yeah. keep hold of them in, in, in earlier years. Uh, Leon Best, uh, McGoldrick were around about that time. That's yeah. slightly more difficult for Knotts because if the money comes in, it is harder to hold on to them. But if you give proper pathways and progressions, you know, and I really hope, I hope that Sam Osborne goes on to have a very good career, genuinely do, but I wish it, if he does, I so wish he'd been allowed to stay at Notts County, you know, uh, it, it, it's difficult. And, you, and you, you would know, James, that w when you get released and we spoke about this, it's very, very difficult as a young kid <coughs> to cope with that, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And like, like we touched on earlier, it kind of, it cha changes your perspective on stuff and, it's a lot more prevalent in the media now with kind of players getting released. But like you said, when you're a kid and you're playing for that club, you and dad sort of alluded to it, like you gain, gain an affinity to that club. And you, be, like you said, you become sort of one of your own, like lads who weren't particularly big Knotts fans growing up would become Knotts fans or whoever, whichever academy they're playing for in an attempt to get into the first team. And, and like you've just listed off there, you, there's, you can count on, sort of one hand the amount of knots sort of players they've brought through in the last in the last few years as a result of obviously shutting the academy down but yeah having a pathway obviously so important okay we're getting a bit deep i don't want to get too deep Let, let's finish on a slightly more sort of a buoyant note so uh james says mr belshaw senior his yeah. idol and I, I can't believe he's had too many down the years, but it was, Gary Strodder was the main man as far as your young'un was concerned when you were taking him along as mascot and all the yeah. rest of it. Now, you've supported Knotts a bit longer. G come on, give, give us a list of some of your best names that you've seen in a black and white shirt. Yeah, there's, only there's, one. One. That <laughs> there's only one. There's only one. The, the greatest ever player that's been on Medellin is Don Masson. The yeah. man was absolutely that that team um you could recite it paul i could you know um you got watlin brindley worthington needham stubbs jones man nixon brad Aitley, crickmore masson just just ran the show what you know that was the season uh, that really started me off and and seeing Don Masson play, he, he was a beautiful footballer. Yeah, and, and he's, got, he's got his book out. And, 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 yeah, I've got, and that's been gun. excellent. <laughs> good, good. Um, I, I, your son said as well, you, 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 you're, you're, quite, you're quite rated, good friend of mine, Lee Hughes. Yeah, Lee Hughes, absolutely incredible. I mean, we, we all go through and, you know, one of, the, one of the most popular things is when you pick your favourite ever Knox 11. And a lot of the players that I would have in that would be the same as yours. Goalkeeper, Radi Abramovic. Yeah, he's, he's else, coming on the show soon. He's coming on the if, show soon. If nothing else for that save against John Robertson at the City Ground when we did him. 
absolutely incredible. You've got Pedro Richard. Hang on, stop there. I'm going to show you something. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. I was, that I was photo there. was on my wall when I was 16 years old. Yeah. No, 17 years old. Yeah, got it from yeah. the post. Yeah, that was, that a, was that when was Forrester won the European that. Cup, uh, Belshaw yeah. Junior. Uh, uh, Champions, uh, Champions League, Champions Cup, whatever you call it. 18 months later, Knox were playing him in the top flight. No one gave us a prayer, went to the city ground. Half an hour gone, Forrest get a penalty. Not looking good, was it? John yeah. Robertson didn't miss penalties. Raddy saved it. We won 2-0. And yeah, Forrest Chris were very quiet did. for a while after that, weren't they? They were very quiet yeah. after that. Yeah, Christian and Ox. What That's a, it. What a day. You know, and then, and then there's players... I'd put Pedro in at right back because I'd want Needham and Shaw as my centre backs. Hey, you, Rayo, talk, you talk about players being released. It must have been, and I want to try and get Jordan on the show because Jordan was cut as well. Yeah. Played a few yeah. games. He was good enough. He got cut. He got cut. And he's now going to be playing us later this year because he's at Kings Lynn. Yeah. Then left back's got to be Rayo. I mean, I had a bit of a memory with Rayo because um, he actually married um, a local girl who went to the same church as James and I grew up going to, Corpus Christi in Clifton. And the priest came round. I was an altar server at the time. And he said, would you like to serve at a wedding today, Paul? And I said, oh, not really, Father. He said, well, it's Ray O'Brien. So I, I was actually an altar <laughs> server at his wedding. <laughs> which which was good. I mean, mid, midfield, you've got Draper, you've got Masson, you've got Phil Turner. What a what a skipper, what a leader. And I'd have Yuzi up from, you know, I've never seen a finisher like him. Absolutely incredible. Tommy Johnson, and then, yeah, McCulloch, you know, if for nothing else for Villa, another European champions, humble yeah. first day of the season stood behind that goal opposite the, the old end you know in the opposite did, end did, did you go in the car or did you go on the special train I went in the car to that yeah. one me and my mate drove and I remember it was that close we were back getting a football post at Clifton at six o'clock we just came straight out got in the car and along the old 453 but yeah I mean wonderful memories some great players we've seen and it makes the present day so sad you know, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, to see where we are now is, is awful. It's heartbreaking. I didn't go to Swindon. I couldn't face it. I'd been, you know, I'd been to Gillingham. Um, I'd been to, obviously, Oldham and a lot of the last days. And I thought, this is just one too many for me. Uh, I, I, I just, I was, my wife and I were in a pub with friends and, you know, for that fleeting moment, I thought we could do it. And then, no, I, I just uh, drowned my sorrows very, very much that night. I think James was saying earlier, was, was, your father was a Knotts fan as well? Yeah, yeah. It was more, the, the biggest Knotts fan in the family was my maternal grandfather. Um, um, my mum, my mum's from the Meadows and grew up on Turney Street, which is just yeah. at the embankment pub. Um, my grandpa Whitby in his life never set foot on the city ground, refused to go on the city ground. Was black Even when Knots were playing? Yeah, was black and white through and through. I mean, it, it really was. And my dad, my dad was a Knots fan growing up, but, but I think once he'd sort of met my mum, it was, uh, you know, grandpa Whitby was the real driving force. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, Going, yeah. I used to when I first started going around the same time as you, good self, late 60s, early 70s. We used to stand on the first barrier back on the junction of the county road and spine cop end where the tunnel used to come through from the uh turnstiles. And there was like me and my dad, and one of my uncles, and um, some of my mum's cousins and all that big sort of family gathering. It was yeah, that was that was where it all started for me. Right. And like right. like you were saying, you had the same thing. You're there at seventeen, eighteen, and all your mates are going to Madrid and uh, and 
and, and Munich watching that lot win the European Cup and you're going to hold them on a cold, wet, windy night, you know. Hey, but I won't swap. Hey, I've got my lad just off camera here. So he's a fifth generation, not so. And we go back to 1888 Football League formation. It's character building, you see. Yeah. If, well, I mean, if, I mean, Junior, part... if Junior hadn't been a Knotts fan, he wouldn't have had the strength of character to become a Football League goalkeeper. If he'd been no. a Forest fan and they'd cut him, it'd have just disappeared with all them 10 A-levels and whatever else he's got, and he'd have gone into business. But yeah, being that... a Knotts fan, he's character building. Black and white yeah. blood makes you strong, doesn't it? <laughs> but that, but, Go but going back to me, um, granddad, his brother, he had uh, actually had his ashes put on Madeleine when he died. Um, and it was at a time when in the Catholic Church you weren't allowed to be cremated. And now he was still cremated and ashes put on Madeleine. So, yeah, not it, through and through. It, well, my, my dad's ashes are on Madeleine as well. And yeah. um, you know, got the home and the away dugout. So yeah. to be fair, not they did it properly. Dug a little hole by the side of the pitch. <laughs> Putting dad's ashes in. It's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? Harold Mace, uh, 1920 to 2001, 2002. So they put the ashes in, and it's just in front of the home dugout. So fast forward a decade, Martin Allen came, and if you remember, this is a wily old fox. He switched the dugouts. Yeah. He switched the dugouts to the other side to be nearer the cop, to get the energy of the cop. And I know Martin, so I wound him up a bit. And I said, my dad's ashes <laughs> were buried under the home dugout. I said, you've now changed it. I can't have his ashes on the bloody on the way dugout. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. I'm sorry. I said, I'm only joking. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter. So, um, Tua, let's finish the summit because uh, James is probably falling asleep with our, with our trips down memory lane. Um, here's one for you. So what would be the proudest moment for you with regards to your son and what he's achieved? Would there be one particular defining moment for you? I think, I think one of the things was, I think going to America was so brave. And I think that was such a, uh, a mature decision and waving goodbye at the airport and seeing him go there and knowing we'd been advised not to go over for the first year so we knew that we waved goodbye in the July wouldn't see him till Christmas and seeing what how he handled that and and how he achieved and what he achieved out there because the proudest thing I have with James is that wherever he's played at all clubs um, he's always always won supporters awards every single one supporters player of the year twice at Tamworth at Harrogate even at Nuneaton when he's gone back there with 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 Tamworth who were like deadly rivals he got a great welcome when he went back to Tamworth with Harrogate, the same thing. His supporters have always warmed to him because of the, you know, young man he is. He's, he's great at interviews. He's great with the media and all that. But he feels it. And supporters know that. You know as a fan. You can see players on that pitch that it means to. And I think the fact that wherever he's gone, he's been a real fan's favourite. And, and that, to me, makes me so proud because the fans are what make football. Very good. James, final word. Any final thoughts? No, it's been quite... Because a lot of the stuff when... It's not often you sit and think about, like, obviously memories as a kid and, uh, and, and you're almost, like, doing this, it, you realise what actually a big part of your life, not County, has been. And... Obviously, you say, oh, you're a Notts fan, you're not Notts fan. When you actually go through and you document your journey from growing up as a fan to playing and, and like, you kind of highlighted the a lot of key decisions and kind of life-changing moments in my life have involved Notts County, whether it's cutting the academy, getting signed for the academy, whether it's at Wembley, like, a lot of my sort of career-defining moments have, have involved Notts County. I think maybe one day I might go back there as a player. I mean... 
I think if you <laughs> I don't think that I don't think Dad would want me to play for Notts, but but no, if there's down the line maybe if, to get a, to get to to actually play a first team game for Notts would it would be something special at some point. But but no, it's been like I said, massive part of my life, and yeah, very grateful. Look, look, guys, there's no better way to end the program than that. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Belshaw That's Senior. Uh, keep going down the lane when we're allowed back. Yeah. What okay. I would say, my dad would always say this, football is very, very cyclical. It's cyclical. Uh, you know, we were a top team when I was a student in Sheffield, 17, 18, 19. We finished 15th, 14th, two straight seasons with Howard Wilkinson. If Howard hadn't left Knotts, we'd have stayed up there and we could have done what Watford did. We could have done what Watford did with Graham Taylor. Um, wasn't to be. Um, clearly now we're massively underpunching. We're massively underpunching. I said to my son, he's basically had what he's 23. He's had one good season, the Munto season. It's basically been the one good season, hasn't it? Yeah. But it will change. But it, oh, it, 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 I guarantee you, as long as we all hang in COVID wise, it will change. It will, because, because that's what football does. That's what football does. And we've, we've still got... I, I can't believe how big our supporter base still is for where we are now. You know, we were always a very, very small club when we were in the top flight. We're now a massive club in a much lower tier. And I think that's one of the problems we've got at the minute. Because I'm not sure, as a club, we necessarily cope with that particularly well at the minute. You know? But look, let's see. We're all getting a bit philosophical. Um, Thank you very, very much indeed, we'll guys. Fun. Thank um, you. All the very best to you at uh, Harrogate. Cheers, uh, Paul. Thank you. You know, you, you've fulfilled your dream. Uh, uh, Mr. Belshaw, have you managed to see him play live in the Football League yet? Have you, has, he, has he got your ticket up there or not? No. No, not been able to at all. Because, uh, yeah, it's been... It's even, even the matches that they've had um, fans in it was just strictly limited to, to season ticket holders. So I've not seen him play since Wembley. <laughs> well, I mean, we get, in fairness, we get the feed. My yes. wife and I watch the feed and the club provide so many um, feeds for, for families and, and that's yeah. good. So we're able to watch him then. But yeah, I can't wait to see him live in the flesh in the football league. And, and presumably, James, and, and Joe, I mean, it must have meant a lot. I mean, I'm not quite sure what but, Harrogate's first game was, but that would have effectively completed your journey back into the Football League, yeah? Yeah, it was, I mean, long, I got injured the first day of pre-season, so we had Wembley, went back to pre-season a week later, and I fractured my thumb in the first session. So um, I actually missed Harrogate's first league game. We played South End, beat them 4-0, actually. Absolutely bad at them. Uh, but my my football league debut came against Bolton October the third. Um, so I made my football league debut against Bolton, and then played every game since. So yeah, long may it continue. Very good. And uh, you're still so you're still living in Nottingham. So you, so you must know the road up to Harrogate, which is not an easy one. If I remember when I went there on that Tuesday night, like the back of your hand, yeah. Yeah. Well, I used to I, I used to live in Ruddington. My first house was there, so I'd got the M1. But now I live bit further out in Radcliffe so I go I'm straight on the 46 and the A1 so and we train in Leeds now because we ripped up the 3G pitch to put a grass pitch and we used to train at the ground so now we train in Leeds so it's only sort of an hour, hour 10 minutes for me and so it's all right. Very good guys it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Yes Paul thank you, you very much. Take you care. Bye. <laughs>